Welcome back to Sea Glass Archaeology, everybody. It is the beginning of spring, and I am so happy that all of the ice has lifted off my shoreline, and I can get out here and pick as many tinies as I can muster for the tourist season. So that's what I was doing out there. I was down at the low tide mark, and I was picking a whole bunch of tinies, but my knees were getting really sore. So I stood up, and I walked up and down the high tide mark, and I made an amazing find, and I'm not monkeying around here. I'm so excited to share it with you. So take a look right over here at this amazing little piece. As you can see everybody, it's a monkey and he's got his hands and they're over his eyes. So I thought to myself, this is probably like a see no evil, speak no evil, hear no evil monkey. And then after I gave it a closer examination here, let me turn it around. I actually saw that it says those words right here on the back. So this is a really neat little find and I'm probably gonna be able to go on the internet and figure out where this comes from if I put enough time into the research, but I'm gonna to have to hypothesize that this is a piece of plastic because it was at the high tide mark. So have a listen when I put this down. So that is 100% not plastic, everybody. You can definitely hear that little bit of a ceramic reverb, that little echo that you get from it. So I'm gonna have to be really careful with my new friend over here and make sure this funky monkey makes it into my historical sea glass display. So I've also made a couple of other great finds, but I wasn't sure if I was gonna make enough great finds to make a full video. But this definitely qualifies as a find worth sharing. So I'm gonna put those finds in this video right now and I hope you enjoy them. So it would seem that I just found the world's smallest red right over here and I just got to the shoreline. So hopefully this is a really good sign. Take a look, it's probably about one millimeter by half a millimeter. And I can't even begin to hypothesize what it comes from because it's so small. Here's an awesome find everyone that I really want to share with you. Now you can see that this piece is actually two-tone. So it's gray over here and it's white on the other side. And there's a little bit of a yellow transition slip right in the middle. Now, almost a year ago, I came across a TV out in the woods and I was able to match pieces that look like this to the glass screen from old television sets. And what's really neat about this piece is when I flip it over, then you almost can see that the gray is on this side right now and now the clear is over here. And then I'm gonna flip it again. And now you can see, look at that, the gray is over here and the clear is right there. It's almost like a little bit of magic. And I've encountered these pieces in the past they are quite rare. Right over here, you can see that I just found a new piece of sea glass. It's clearly bonfire, and it's really amazing because you can see that there's some amber brown on the right side, and then over here it's clear, and you can see a bunch of air pockets or bubbles from the fire as the glass was in a molten state and it fused together. When you find a piece of bonfire glass, it's a really good indication that you're in an old rubbish tip or an old rubbish cove, so you can find almost anything out here. This is a really neat little find, and I don't remember the last time I found a piece of bonfire that was multicolored, but I have found quite a few in the past, so I'm gonna put a picture in right now of some of my favorites. I also found this tiny, tiny little shard of ceramic, this little pottery shard. You can see it's just a fraction of the size of my index fingernail, but there's just enough of a pattern right over here that we can match this to the willow pattern. And I've done that a lot because the willow pattern is the most common form of transfer wear in the world. And it started in the late 1700s. It's been produced in over 40 countries since its origins. And uh, gosh, it's even been made into little tea sets. What I really like about this little piece right over here is when I turn it over on the side, you can see that there's actually a little bit of blue slip on the edge to it. So this probably would have been really small, like some sort of a saucer. It could have even been from a kid's cup. Now take a look at this absolutely stunning piece of yellow, everybody. It's too bad that it's actually a piece of plastic. I just found it at the high tide mark, not far from when the monkey is. And you can tell by the shape, and especially when I flip it over, I'm gonna drop it. <laughs> That's what I do, it's a little bit slick. So you can tell when I flip it over, right over here by this indentation, that this is 100% a little piece of yellow plastic. It had me excited for a little bit, if not for the fact that I found it at the high tide mark. Now a piece like this, I can probably hypothesize, actually came from like a toy ring that a kid might have purchased in the candy stores around 1980, 1970, maybe even a little bit earlier than that. 
who knows, it could actually be from some sort of a kid's toy, but I definitely know that it's plastic. And I can tell that this is plastic because if I put it inside a container and I swirl it around, there's a bunch of sea glass in it once the container is filled with water, the plastic is going to flutter up and down and most of the glass is going to remain at the bottom of the container. I could also take a pin and put it on this piece and then push the pin right through it because glass and plastic have different points where they become malleable and they start to melt. Where glass starts to melt at about 550 degrees, plastic starts to melt at about 150 degrees. So that means that a hot pin could push right through a piece of plastic like this. But I don't want to ruin it. I want to keep it as a proper learning tool to teach people who come and visit my sea glass shanty. So it's officially low tide right now. It's a little bit after three o'clock and I was going through all of the big boulders that are now exposed that were underwater and I came across the absolutely nicest piece of Kelly Green that I've ever seen in my entire life. Take a look everybody. It's aged to perfection and it's bigger than a medallion. It's almost a perfect 10 but I can see it's got a big crease right through the middle. Some sort of a little bit of a stress mark which is known as bruised glass in the glass world. It's wild because normally if I find a nice big piece of Kelly Green like this, I associate it with being from a consumer beverage bottle like a 7-Up or a Sprite or a ginger ale or maybe even a 28-ounce wine bottle. But the truth of the matter is, is a piece like this is way too thick to be from the bottom of one of those bottles. I have found way too many of them in my life, so it's a bit of a mystery what this piece actually comes from. But one thing I can say without a doubt is it's probably been in the ocean for three quarters of a century to up to a full century because it's just aged to perfection. As I said, it's just perfectly round and it's just spectacular. I'm so happy that I found that big piece of green because about a half an hour ago I came across another piece that is just as round. You can see that it's a nice piece of pink. But this piece right over here wasn't aged to perfection. It was actually made this way. This right over here, when I hold it flat on my thumb, you can see is nice and pancaked down. It's actually what's known as a vase filler and you can buy this in a craft store. Now, a lot of times when I see these in international sea glass groups, it's a good indication to me that this means that somebody's seeding the beaches. And what that means is they're putting new glass out on the shoreline to discover later on as genuine sea glass. But because I only found one of these, for me, it's pretty easy for me to hypothesize that this is an isolated incident and this actually could have come out onto the shoreline through the storm sewers, which empty a couple of hundred feet right in front of me. So I'm going to be taking it home with me because it is rubbish. And maybe I'll find a way to repurpose it. I'm just not sure what it's going to be for yet. So I came across these two tiny little fragments over here and they both have a little bit of red on them and they both have very different origins. This one over here you can actually see is a little bit of amberina red. So it actually transitions from orange to red. And because of the hole right in the middle right over here, I can hypothesize safely that this was actually from a glass bead. And then this piece right over here, I'm pretty sure is from an old sea marble because when I turn it over, you can actually see there's a little bit of melt glass and there's a swirl of red. <laughs> I'm just giddy here, everybody. I'm sure you can tell by my smile on my face that I just made another great find. Well, I found a lot of tiny little pieces of red and I finally found one that's a lot bigger. So take a look right over here, everybody. It's a beautiful piece of red. It's almost like a cherry glow and it's got a little bit of a hobnail pattern to it. Now, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that this piece actually might have a bit of cadmium in it. And now cadmium is a property that fluoresces under the spectrum of a UV light. So we're going to go home and I'm going to turn off all the lights and I'm going to take out the black flashlight, the little black light, and we're going to see if this piece actually fluoresces under the spectrum of a black light. I'm so happy that I just found it because all those little reds were just teasing me and it's just amazing that I can find so many tinies and that I can find a really nice big piece like this one right over here. So I was just taking that picture everybody and then it occurred to me that maybe I should elaborate on what I mean when I say it's hobnail glass. See hobnail refers to the pattern on the surface of this glass which has these little round circular bumps on it. Now, commonly when I encounter hobnail glass, it's on melt glass, which is actually made with tin. And I also see it as well in red glass because red glass would have been something that was really ornate and fancy, some sort of tableware or some sort of a vessel. So this piece over here was definitely meant to be ornate and that's why it has this really unique hobnail pattern on it. 
So I found this really neat piece of clear glass, and as you can see, it's extremely well aged. And then when I flip it over, it's got this little indentation to it. It almost looks like a finger with a fingernail on it to me. But I know enough about glass history to know that this was actually a little pocket of gas from the molten glass batch, and that kind of indicates strongly that this was made before the automation process begun and was perfected around 1930. And what that speaks to is that this actual piece of glass came off the top of the batch of the molten glass where pockets of gas would rise to the surface and then they find themselves onto the glass maker's rod. So you wouldn't really see that in the automation process because the glass comes through the bottom of a hopper so all the air pockets or bubbles are on the top. So in the bottle collecting world this is known as a seeded piece of glass or a seeded bottle which is really unique and when I first started collecting sea glass I used to think that they were actually pockets of air and I used to dream about what the air would have smelled like in the 1800s. Now that I know that it's dangerous gas I would never want to smell the pockets inside of glass but maybe I'm going to put a few pictures in the video and give you some more examples of what this glass looks like when it's got these big pockets in it. And what's even amazing is sometimes when the bottle would be stretched, you can actually see elongated air pockets or gas pockets inside of the neck as they're getting stretched by the glass maker well over a century ago. Take a look everyone, I just came across another really tiny well-aged speck of red. It's nice and bright, it might become the nose of a reindeer or the top of a Christmas tree. I'd say it's about a millimeter and a half by a millimeter across and I'm excited to put it in the bag. The shadows are getting long everybody, but right over here I saw that there's a really nice piece of purple. It's not that well aged and a piece like this I don't think is manganese glass. A piece like this could be depression era glassware. It could even be from some sort of a baking dish which I've observed before in the past. So I'm going to take it home with me and I'm going to put it into a nice little sun catcher. So here we are everybody, I'm back at home and I've got my trusty UV flashlight right over here. We're about to turn out the lights and find out if this really nice piece of hobnail red has cadmium in it. Lights go out and take a look at that sure fire. It absolutely does fluoresce under the spectrum of a UV light. Now cadmium is a carcinogen, however it was added to glass batches to help it reach its melting point a little bit lower. I'm so glad that I got back down to the shoreline today everybody. I'm not sure if you can tell behind me but the sun is starting to creep down below which means that it's well into the evening. It's going to be time for me to go home. This has been a great day. If you take a look at this bag over here you wouldn't think that I've been here all afternoon but the majority of the pieces that I found today were just microscopically small and tiny. So it's always amazing when I can find a big piece like this one in the same spot that I'm looking for some of the smallest sea glass in the world. So thanks for watching everybody. Hopefully I'm back out on the shoreline again real soon. I've been thinking a lot about going out to North Sydney to Indian Beach because it's been far too long since I've been there. So hopefully I get to make that trip happen real soon.